Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world. On Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Kea. Today, we're looking at the doomsday clock, ticking towards existential end of humanity, 90 seconds before midnight, closest ever. But a human rights-based approach to avoid an apocalypse. Today, I'm joined by former commanders and current campaigners, and we are excited to look at what we can discuss to avoid this existential threat. Aloha, and today we're looking at the doomsday clock. And I'd like to welcome first Alan Ware, Director of Basel Peace Office. Alan, as the Global Coordinator of Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, why is the doomsday clock so important and what should we do about making sure it doesn't get any closer? Joshua, thank you so much for having this really important show. And this is a really important announcement from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists uh, that the hands of the doomsday clock are 10 seconds closer to midnight than the same time last year. This comes from a scientific approach. So these are scientists, they're analyzing the situation, the risks to humanity, and in particular, the risks from a possible nuclear war and climate change and also the unraveling of multilateralism, the rise of nationalism, which is creating more conflicts and putting us in peril. So it's very important to have the scientific basis. Uh, from then we can look at what are some policies that are important to work on. Um, and a key thing with, the, with this announcement, every year they do this, and they do it on the anniversary of the very first resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, which put forward the objective of the elimination of, they called them atomic weapons back then, atomic weapons and all other weapons of mass destruction. So the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists does that to basically say, look, we have a huge problem. It's a global issue. We can work on our with our, with our own governments, our parliamentarians, our mayors in our own countries, but we also have to work internationally. And the United Nations is the best forum to do that. And we could talk later in the program about the various ways we can take forward uh, these objectives of, uh, say, preventing nuclear war and protecting the world from climate change and other existential threats through key United Nations forums and processes. Alan, thank you so much for that historical lesson, but also holistic perspective about peace, sharing that the purpose of the UN, of course, was to end the scourge of war and how far we have not gone yet. Robert, it's an honor to have you because you're probably one of the rare people that it's such a responsibility, as we say in Hawaii, a kuleana on your shoulders during your career regarding nuclear weapons. Can you share with us an insight into what you were dealing with and why you're now campaigning for nuclear abolition? Well, hello, Joshua. Thank you very much for inviting me on the program. It's a pleasure to be here, and particularly so in company with Michaela and uh, Ivan, young activists, because it's youth that's going to carry this movement forward. Uh, I'm quite old. I was at sea in the Cold War. I joined the submarines in 1962, and I was at sea as uh, second in command of uh, HMS Repulse. Uh, a Polaris missile firing submarine in 1972. The second in command is command qualified in case the captain goes sick. And in the two years I was on board, in fact, I had to take command because he was sick with a condition on two separate occasions. So I was both uh, in command and second in command, and therefore in the chain for launching weapons. At the time, in 72, of course, was quite height of the Cold War. Uh, being a young officer, uh, you did what you were told and you believed what you were told. And we were told that actually uh, nuclear weapons kept the peace. Uh, but my captain and I, before we went on patrol and faced with the likely possibility that we would have to launch weapons, did discuss, would we launch weapons? And we said that uh, if we knew that our country was under attack, which is what we told we were defending against and threatening so it didn't happen, but if we knew that we were under attack, we probably would launch. I have to say quite a few Kamani officers said probably, because until push comes to shove, you don't know actually whether you will carry out what is essentially a revenge attack. The one thing we were sure of, though, was we would not fire first. 
if we had an order to launch and we thought nobody had launched at us, we would stop, think, and consider whether we really would launch a nuclear war based on intelligence. Intelligence is always fallible. So that was my condition in 1972 to 74. And for the rest of my time in the service, I guess that mentally continued to be my approach. In retirement, with more time, and facing a bit of a financial crisis in the UK at about the time we were buying the next class of submarine when uh, budgets were tight, I decided to investigate uh, whether we could afford to carry on with the deterrent now the war was down and the Cold War had finished, because I thought, well, do we need it? And the next, it started off as a financial thing, cost benefit, but it slowly I got deeper and deeper into the ethics of nuclear war and deterrence, the theory of deterrence, read more widely and educated myself. And the first thing I realized was <laughs> that when we'd been told that we would never fire first in 72, that was not true. There was a secret plan that we would, if necessary, according to the government, but they didn't tell us. And once you've lost a bit of confidence, the wall very quickly falls down, as did the Berlin Wall. And I moved quite quickly to understanding that not everything I'd been told was correct, and not everything I'd been, I hadn't been told everything. Four years later, I decided for myself that there was only one thing to do, and that was to get rid of nuclear weapons. And we didn't seem to be making any great attempt to do so. There was no plan, no pathway, and no motivation. <clears throat> so I undertook to try within the Navy to educate naval officers as to the facts. Education, education, education. And I found out that a lot of the Navy didn't know the facts. And from that position, I kept on campaigning uh, to try and make as much noise as I can and tell people the truth. And that's where I am today. Well, we thank you for sharing about that harrowing task during that time, but also your personal transformation to decide that peace is the only way to go forward. We now move to our youth to work with youth fusion. Mikael, I'm very excited to hear about your perspective. When you hear about this doomsday clock clicking ever closer to catastrophe, and in fact, 2023, it's the closest ever since the bolt of atomic scientists began measuring the metaphorical timepiece. What's the first thought that comes to your mind as we move from 100 seconds to 90 seconds? Hi, everyone, and thank you so much um, for that question. I think it's a uh, very crucial and one that I think we all have on our minds now, especially in times of a climate catastrophe and also the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and I think the first thing that comes to my mind when I saw that news is, you know, as a young person who's lived through all of this uh, in the past um, year, is that I'm, I'm not surprised um, at, at what, what's been happening um, and, and the results of the doomsday clock. I was expecting it um, sometimes a little bit to be worse um, because I think as a young person in, in some regard, our hope is kind of lost. Um, and that's why I think that it's so important to keep putting our energies collectively into, into projects um, such as the ones that Youth Fusion uh, have been spearheading um, and really raise these issues with youth and to, to make a network and a community of people to lean on each other and, and give each other hope um, that we can make a difference. Because I think that that's kind of the only thing that we can we can cling on to right now because there's so many knock-on effects that you know this whole war has um has created uh, economically europe is really in a mess it's a very um tough time for for young people to to find work um and we're all feeling it and that's why youth fusion is really you know it's standing out as this worldwide net uh, working platform for individuals to really band together and and say no to nuclear weapons because i think um you know that's what's really holding uh, this war hostage right now. It's it's a complete unfair, um, you know, playing field. Uh, and there's really, with nuclear weapons um, at the disposal of, of great powers, uh, we're in a deadlock right now. And um, I think that's why we need to come with other solutions, like the solutions of human security, common security. And I think that young people really have that mentality. 
And that's why Youth Fusion, um, our goal is to in, uh, inform, educate, connect, and engage young people so they are actually equipped with the tools and the knowledge to be confident to actually go out there and, and you know, put out some form of resistance. Um, so, for example, we do that uh, mostly through educating, and I think that that's why um, Mr. Forsyth was uh, very much reaffirming our education efforts. Um, so that was uh, that was very heartwarming to hear that you agree with that. Um, and we've also um, had various projects um, relating to our network. So we very much value that because I think people, young people especially, are our power. Um, but not only young people, we also very much value intergenerational dialogue because young people cannot stand alone in this issue. We need older people uh, and people of all work, walks of life to really come together because Nuclear disarmament on its own, it's not a standalone issue. It impacts so many other areas of our security, our sustainability, and Youth Fusion really works to, to work across networks. So, for example, we work a lot with the climate movement because nuclear disarmament and climate are very, very deeply, deeply linked. They're both, you know, the two biggest factors in the in the doomsday clock uh, and very existential matters. We also work with um, people within the feminist movement. Nuclear disarmament has feminist roots. And we really try to, to tap into different pockets um, of sort of the social, uh, economic, and political causes to say, hey, nuclear weapons impact you because so many people are very much detached from, from what nuclear weapons do and what, what their impacts are. Um, so that's why we're really trying to make it as relevant to young people and to older people um, as much as possible and just say, hey, this issue really impacts us all. And I think that's why the doomsday clock is so uh, important to raise issues. And really, you know, it, it has been effective at, you know, kind of pinning nuclear weapons and the climate uh, crisis together to say, hey, these are actually two of our biggest existential threats. Um, and that's why Youth Fusion really, really works to promote that. And I think uh, Ivan will We'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of um, his personal projects, which are very, very inspiring. Mahalo, Mikhail, and very sobering reflection from a youth to that sense of hope and potential despair if we don't take direct action immediately, but also really amazing deep sip of wisdom from the well that you share about how we have to connect all the dots, the feminist foreign policy perspective, but also going deeper, really. It's a decolonization and a decarbonization where you know that, yes, indigenous people would have never tested nuclear weapons or detonated them on their sacred lands from their perspective of living in harmony with the land and being part of nature. And moving to Ivan, Ivan, can you share your perspectives when you heard about the doomsday clock being so close? Well, today, I think young people are faced with this challenge. We are constantly wondering, how do we reach out to policymakers uh, when they seem so estranged from us, especially when it comes to disarmament issues, or how can we advance disarmament policies, such as no first use, for example, that we want to see implemented in our future. And I think, well, we are faring pretty well. Today, we are surrounded by an abundance of youth networks that engage the public in discussing the weaknesses and strength of the, let's say, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We have the UN Youth for Disarmament Initiative. What I'm particularly alarmed by in the light of the Doom Days Clock announcement is that we, we as international community in general, we tend to shy away from creating common collaboration spaces with those we tend to portray as wicked or threatening, such as Russia, Iran, China. And the Dizarma network we are trying to build is thus incomplete. And for this reason, I think Youth Fusion and other international youth-led organizations are working towards challenging the conventional, you know, West-East drift and propose a novel interpretation of the famous, let's say, Russian-American diplomatic hotline that in the 21st century goes well beyond that cooperation between the two giant superpowers and involves, you know, a greater deal of actors young people, civil society organizations. Uh, and that said, I'm positive that youth organizations' contribution to building this nuclear weapons free world in cooperation with senior experts and, well, fellow campaigners like uh, Michaela just noted, is essential to move the dial on the doomsday clock. 
And one of my personal projects is the uh, youth hotline campaign that we're kind of developing right now. It's aimed to bring together young people who share the belief that disarmament efforts taken by Russia and the United States are critical to ridding the world of nuclear weapons. We want to foster this continuous knowledge exchange and bridge the trust gap uh, between the two nations, specifically concerning nuclear disarmament, by creating an online platform where both the Russians and Americans would be able to engage in a direct informal dialogue. And I think this is what we need. And I think this is what we're having right now. And I'm very grateful uh, for, organi- for, for you uh, for organizing this amazing talk. Thank you. Well, the clock is ticking and the doomsday clock moved from 100 seconds to 90 seconds, measuring that theoretical point of annihilation. And the loss of 10 seconds, they say, is due mainly to the war in Ukraine and the veiled threats of nuclear warfare, as well as the existential threat, though, of climate change facing everyone on Earth, but also even pandemics as well. Alan, can you show how you're connecting all these issues? I know you're recently at the Universal Periodic Review Working Group in Geneva, but we know you do many other activities around the planet. Yeah, so a key thing I'll follow up on from Ivan on this is uh, connecting across divides is so important. Whether that's at the international level, there's a divide between, for example, the Russian narrative surrounding the reasons for the invasion of Ukraine and the West narrative and the Ukraine narrative. And often you know, the, the, the leaders are just talking past each other. You know, I've been to like an OSCE of parliamentary assembly before the invasion and seen the Russians getting up and shouting at the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians shouting at the Russians and people were just taking sides and it didn't get anywhere. You know, we have to eat, we have to respect that we ha- will have differences of opinion with others, but we have to bridge across that and try and engage with people whether that's the international level or whether it's within countries. You know, there has been a division with, but in, inside countries also and people not engaging with each other and just holding negative images and then just dismissing other people who have different things. So this hotline idea, I think, works at many different levels. It's really important and it goes along with the idea of what the United Nations was set up to do, which was to establish security on a common security basis. This is the idea that security is not based just by defending yourself with weapons and threatening those who might disagree with you, but but considering that everybody has security concerns or issues. So what we need to do is try and resolve conflicts. And so we do that through a number of mechanisms, and many of them are established by the United Nations, but they're also established through the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe through the Helsinki Accords. These include things like negotiation, mediation, good diplomacy, uh, arbitration, you know, adjudication, which is like using courts, International Court of Justice, using international law and laying down legal principles so that you have a basis for moving ahead in agreement. This is laid out, as I said, in the United Nations, and the United Nations has many ways that civil society can come in and work with like-minded governments in the many different forums to advance these common security ideas. We can do it in the UN General Assembly, where we can like adopt resolutions, for example, and initiate processes. We can do it in the International Court of Justice, where we can help resolve conflicts using the law rather than using force. Or we can do it through the Human Rights Council, where Josh, you and I were just a couple of weeks ago, because these issues are human rights issues. We have a right to life. We have a right to a healthy environment. We have a right to a sustainable future. These are all laid down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other human rights instruments. And in the Human Rights Council and of the other human rights bodies, we as civil society can go in there and we can say, look, these governments, you know, they're up for review. They're not implementing these rights. Here are our, our recommendations and we have dialogue and we're heard. Um, and, you know, we, we did this in, in an event in Geneva at the Human Rights Council on the side and follow up the Doomsday Clock announcement just last week. Um, and we had really good engagement of governments, experts uh, in that process. So I encourage people to think, look at the possibilities, particularly through the United Nations, to be able to take these ideas forward and engage. Thank you. For that holistic perspective, talking about the United Nations international regime, especially with human rights, but also the OSCE and the four baskets looking at Helsinki are absolutely crucial. We know the doomsday clock points out that we're living in an unprecedented danger. Robert, can you share with us some ways that we can actually move that dial back a bit and show that we can actually save humanity as well as our own only planet Earth? Uh, 
Yes, the line I've taken is I don't think there's a switch you can turn and everybody suddenly gets rid of their nuclear weapons. I think in the real world, we have to take steps and we people just won't walk away from it straight away. So the first thing I think is to educate them that actually the biggest danger of nuclear weapons probably comes from inadvertent use or use through misunderstanding or just straight accidents. I mean, in Hawaii, from where your program is going, not too long ago, there was the alarm that went off. And had there been a trigger-happy missile commander who decided he on his own initiative had fired, we'd have had a nuclear war. Most people are not aware of the 14 or 15 serious incidents that have occurred, which were really nuclear near misses. So that's one way of educating them. Uh, the second thing I try and do is to persuade people as a first step. Nobody really wants to fire a nuclear weapon deliberately as a first strike. People all talk about it being defensive, a second strike weapon. So let's do away with first strike. No first use. Policy that President Biden said he endorsed but hasn't carried forward, but to generate support from that among a large number of people. And, and to keep on pressing the matter, it, it's all about pressure and talk. I think the third thing is to keep pointing out the TPNW, the Treaty to Prohibit Nuclear Weapons, uh, complements the new non-proliferation treaty, doesn't replace it. It actually gives strength to Article 6 of the NPT. It's not in competition. It's what we're trying to do. And mainly just to keep on talking, educating, putting the facts on the table. I've got two sons who are in the media business. And when I said to them, how do you get the message across? And they say, Dad, you just keep on throwing stones into the pond and the ripples will travel and you never know how far. Just keep on throwing the stones. Well, Robert, we're glad to have a really good arm. And we appreciate you for reminding us in Hawaii about that morning. I remember standing at, after walking my dogs at Diamond Head, Leahi, and looking over the Pacific, and then people all of a sudden freaking out and trying to put their kids in man underneath manholes. And we know there is no way to survive. But that was just a moment, a 15-minute glimpse of what yeah. catastrophe we could face. We also thank you for bringing up the TPNW and the NPT. We have the tools. And maybe, Michaela, you can share with us some of the actions that you're taking to remind people the same way Robert has. He talked about almost a dozen near circumstances like the Hawaii one. And really, nuclear is forever. It is life. So maybe you can share what the youth are doing to make sure that you never have to experience this in your lifetime. For sure. I think that that's a youth fusion specialty, so to speak. Um, I think that it's for us, we work on a very uh, grassroots um, activism level. Of course, we also uh, have some dealings uh, from the top down level whenever we get the opportunity. Um, but my advice is uh, to everyone, uh, especially young people, um, everybody can be an activist. Everybody can take small actions. Uh, for example, with the climate movement, you can recycle, uh, you can make social media posts. And with nuclear disarmament, there are so many networks and organizations that will take you in with the, with open arms. Um, youth for TPNW, Youth Fusion, um, the youth in the UK, the, the CND youth has a, a very strong faction going on. Um, just do some research. Um, you can even reach out to some of us at Youth Fusion. We can guide you in the, in the right direction. There's so many things that you can do. And um, just to share with you, when I started out, uh, three years ago within the nuclear disarmament field, I was clueless. I didn't know much, um, but I quickly learned and you can too. So just put yourself out there. Don't be afraid. And as I said again, I'll say it again. Everybody can be an activist. Your voices will ripple, as Robert said. Very true. We just need to be informed, be involved and to make a difference. Ivan, can you share a bit more about how you're making a difference and what youth can do? Right. I absolutely agree with Michaela's words that everyone, everyone's voice and everyone's action matters. And I think uh, what I'm particularly doing with Youth Fusion and as Secretariat at uh, Abolition 2000 is literally putting everyone together, joining the organizations, joining the movements, joining the campaigns, reposting, tweeting, um, reading. is It is as essential as taking part in a huge event, you know? 
uh, what some of my peers and friends forget, and I've had this conversation many times with them, that, well, a lot of my friends tend to believe that track the second track diplomacy doesn't work. You know, the back channel diplomacy is really not as efficient. Well, I've seen this play out very differently. And I think I think this it is the human connection that really helps change the perspective, the attitude of our governments, of our leaders, of our, our society. And this is what I'm particularly interested in doing is understanding the people in the first place, their perspectives, connecting with them and then influencing them because we learn through each other. And uh, this is how, you know, this is how our world works. And I'm very happy to be part of the youth community for disarmament and work with Michaela and other beautiful people. <laughs> it is. It's a beautiful trouble that we're making for a better tomorrow. And it brings up the point that uh, Alan was looking at last week is some of the governments called it sharp edges, that you have nuclear disarmament, that you have climate crisis, and that you have human rights. And those, what we're really looking at is sort of shattering those silos. Alan, could you share in the future what vision we have so that we never have to think of this doomsday clock getting even closer, but more importantly, a future where everyone wants to wake up to a better way? and shows what's possible with peace. Yeah, thanks, Joshua. And one simple action that we have got, which makes these connections, is the appeal called Protect People and the Planet, Appeal for a Nuclear Weapons Free World. It starts off with the uh, measure which uh, Rob mentioned, uh, we need to prevent a nuclear war and call for no first use policies to be adopted. So that's a call one. Call two, we need a, a vision for a nuclear weapons free world. So that's the call, at least by 2045, the 100th anniversary of the United Nations. And call three is let's shift the resources that are going into nuclear weapons, $100 billion a year, shift those into protecting the climate, into public health, into peace, into sustainable development. You know, it's shifting those resources. That makes the connections showing disarmament can help human rights and development. And that appeal is on our website, unfoldzero.org, and anyone can sign. And then if you do, we take that appeal into meetings in the United Nations. And it's a, it's a door opener, you know, where we say, look, we'd like to meet, you know, with a particular ambassador. because we'd like to present the appeal. You get the meeting and then they get to see, oh, look, there's lots of endorsers from their countries. And what Ivan was saying is you create personal relationship with these people. You're not coming in as like an adversary, even though you might be disagreeing with their policies. You're coming in to share with them, open up, talk and say, how can we? work together for a nuclear weapons free world. This is something we need to do with those who rely on nuclear weapons at the moment. We ha it's something we have to do also with those who still rely on fossil fuels. We can't treat them as enemies. We have to help people in the transition to a nuclear free and a fossil fuel free world. Thank you so much, Alan. And that really does bring us to the end. But we want to thank everyone for sharing about this doomsday clock. More importantly, for all of the actions that you're taking to make sure that we move towards peace as a human right, that we make sure that we have a clean, sustainable environment, and more importantly, a future that's free. And we thank you, Alan, as well as Robert, for reinforcing that, how you came at it from a financial aspect of how we could do better, but also understanding the fundamental freedoms of the way that the world can be. Thank you both as well, Mikhail and Ivan, for dedicating your lives to a better world so that you and future generations also won't have to live in the world that we live in today, only 90 seconds away from doomsday. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, Please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.